And then one day you came to the end of yourself and realized you needed something more than just yourself. Something more than just the world's entertainment and you discovered Jesus. Therefore, the scripture is fulfilled. Blessed is the man that comes to the end of himself for theirs is the kingdom of God. Amen. So God says when you realize you can't do it on your own and you sign up with me, I'll reveal an entire kingdom that you could not see before and I'll open the door so you can have access to it. Hey, look at the person next to you and say, you are really blessed. Do you know that? <laughs> Amen. All right. <clears throat> We have been doing the Truth About series, and we, we have done two sessions on prayer. We've done two sessions on prayer, and we're going to take a slight break, still on prayer, and then come back and do two more sessions on how to develop your prayer life. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, I know how to pray, but did you know, maybe, maybe you do, and, and that's good. But you know, there's a lot of times people are intimidated to lead prayer. Like, for example, if you're called upon at your house or something to lead everybody in a, a prayer over the meal. Sometimes people are intimidated and, you know. In other words, so doing a series on prayers to encourage you to develop that good relationship with God. How many here know that you can have a relationship with your mom and dad, maybe your brother or sister, but it takes a while to develop a close relationship so when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we developed a relationship. We became sons and daughters of God. Amen? And as becoming sons and daughters of God, God says, all right, walk with me, learn about me, so you and I can show you another realm that I have for you that the world cannot provide. How many here has been blessed since you accepted Jesus Christ? And how many here realize that sometimes it's not an easy trip? Because the enemy tries to lay trips on us and guilt. He might even have another Christian put you down or something like that. But remember, this is why our eyes are to be where? On God. I know it's a simple message. We haven't even got started today. Eyes on Jesus. Why? Because he's not going to insult you. He's not going to put you down. He's going to always, even in your worst condition, he's going to show you, give you hope. He's going to show you that your life's not done. You're not over. Can you say amen? Hey, look at Moses. He started when he was 80. <laughs> so why do we have it in our mind that, oh, you know, so we want to get those limitations off of you. Can you say amen? And get your eyes off the world. Get your eyes off of other people. And I've always said, please, don't put your eyes on me. It's easy to get eyes on somebody that you warm up to. You know, if it's going to be your wife, fine. If it's going to be your husband, fine. But if it's going to be your pastor, eyes on Jesus. Eyes on Jesus, okay? And the reason being because you'll put me in a position of failure when you put your eyes on me. You might not know that, but you, you will. If I get my eyes on you... That's not good either. Because then the tendency of my temptation is to give you what you need. <laughs> How many parents do we have in here? Amen. Hey, Alan. Come here. I haven't started preaching yet, so this is just warming up to everybody. God told me to give you this. Oh, thank you very much. All right. Amen. Thank God. All right. What is man? Our lesson today is what is man? So we're going to open it up. And I want you to take your Bibles and go with me to Psalms chapter 8. Psalms chapter 8. We're going to look at 3 through 6. God made us in his image after his likeness. Now, let me explain a few things. God has been creating this whole time. And then somewhere along the plan, he got together and he said, in Genesis 1, let us create man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over everything that creepeth upon the earth. Now you stay in Psalms 8, okay? 
All right. So God made us in, how did he make us? I have to tell you this, in his image after his likeness. So guess what? Male or female, black or white, Japanese, Chinese, it doesn't really matter. We're human. We're on two legs. We breathe. We're made in the light, in the image of God. God stands on two feet, has a head, shoulders, just like the Bible describes him. Okay? We're made in his image. So, next time you look in the mirror and say, God, are you in there? <laughs> and then it says, and after his likeness. Likeness means mannerisms. You look like him, and you should act like him. Can you say amen? Now, we all know we fall short to that. So, everything God did, and you can imagine how Satan felt about this. Satan thought he was Mr. Cool. But God had another creation, you and I. In his image, after his likeness, and Satan didn't like that. Are you with me? And so he sets off immediately. I got to corrupt this. This cannot be. So you need to know, just kind of take a note because this is going to open up to you now that I said that. Everything God did was for his new creation, the last crowning creation in his own image after his own likeness. So don't get all puffed up that God would make us that way. But he did. How many here know that we got thrown into this planet with all its problems? Even though we don't like it and we didn't ask for it, we are here. Right? So, we need to find out the plan, Stan. We need to get with the, the facts so that we can work with God knowing he's on our side. Say amen. All right. God made us... A three-part being. So you stay in Psalms, okay? Let me read this to you. You stay in Psalms 8, okay? I'm just building a foundation, okay? He says that, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify, set you apart completely, and may your whole spirit, listen, there's three of them, soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord. He who calls you, he is faithful, who also will do it. So you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. Everyone say amen. amen. I'm a spirit. God is a spirit. I'm a soul. God has a soul. And I live in a body. This body isn't the original. You got to hand me down from the enemy. When God first created man, he was in whose image? God's. Whose likeness? You were literally a light creature, for God is light, and in him is no. So we were light creatures. We literally had shape. We were beautiful. Everything was cool, and we were light creatures. And then Satan came in gave an alternative and of course they bought it and they were changed their chromosomes and DNA was altered I don't I, don't ask me how but when they digested that whatever that was that fruit which God didn't put in the garden there's another story another sermon for you who put the tree in the garden that one it wasn't God okay so I'll just tantalize you a little bit. And so, of course, they ate, changed their DNA. And so, the light left. The fellowship with God shut down and man separated first spiritually and then later on died physically. So, when the Bible says, if you eat of this tree in dying, you will die. That's what, the, that's what the Hebrew says. You eat of the tree, you're going to separate from God immediately and death will come into you. Satan's nature. And eventually you will physically die. And we know Adam and Eve somewhere in 900 some odd years died. Hello. And people have been dying ever since. But that's not the way we were originally made. Right? 
So let me tell you, before we get into this, God has made you back into that kind of creature, a light creature, a God creature, when you walk with him. When you walk by yourself, you are your own person. But when you walk with the Lord, you're a God creature. You don't look the same in the spirit. You don't act the same in the spirit. Your entire thinking and everything is literally under the spirit. And if you've ever been under the anointing of God, you are not yourself. It's the God working in you. I've been in meetings where literally people have leaped out of wheelchairs. Many great things happened and I didn't do a thing. All God wanted me to do is get where I needed to be so he could say things through me. He needed to get me where I needed to be so he could speak through me. I'm not anybody special. Neither are you. But when we walk with Jesus, yes, you become. Are you still with me? So God wants our whole spirit, soul, and body, okay? Note, we have three parts Spirit, soul, and body, each has a part in our own life and our functions. Can you say amen? We need to know what they are. All right, so, but we must understand what part does what instead of guessing about our life. Did you know a lot of Christians, a lot of people out there still guessing? What's tomorrow going to hold? I don't know, depending on which hand you, you go after. Let's go on. Listen to this. This should be fun. As we get into this with you and I, we can just laugh at ourselves because I'm just going to open it up, try to give you as much information about you as an individual. Now, what I want to say is, this is not scientific that I'm sharing with you. This is gospel. This isn't, isn't all the college stuff. So when I talk about your mind, I'm not going to go into all the details about your mind. When I talk about your body, I'm not going to go into all the details about your body, how it functions and, and how if you stretched out your, you know, your blood vessels that go around the earth 20 times, blah, 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 blah. No, we're going to talk about how does it relate to the scripture so that you can apply it and you understand what you are experiencing every day and put it in its right perspective. Can you say Amen. And I don't know about you, but I'm the kind of person that wants to give out understanding and not just yell a bunch and scream and talk about myself and my grandma and all the things that God did in my life. That's testimony. No, I want to give you the words so you understand who you are in Christ. Say amen, somebody. All right, so Psalms 8, you got it? What is man that you are mindful of him? Okay, now let me give you a story. Here David is sitting... Possibly in his yard, maybe on the top of the roof. And he's looking up at the stars. How many's ever done that? And he's thinking about God. God, here am I was a shepherd boy and you made me a king and you did all that. And he's thinking about why would you love mankind that way? And after making all the stars and the moon and the sun and all that, why would you even be thinking about me? And here's why. He says right here, in Psalms 8. When I consider your heavens and your work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful? You put your mind on him. And the son of man that you visited him. For you have made him a little lower than the angels. We're, we're a weaker creature than angels, folks. Angels, as far as I know, the ones that I've seen are pretty tall and pretty strong. And they have supernatural powers from God. Amen. And I'm quite paling in size and in with myself considering them. If someday you were able to see your angels, you'd never be afraid again. Because they're always with you. Now they're not always helping you because sometimes we're talking stuff we shouldn't. Moving right along. For you have made him a little lower than the angels, crowned him with glory and honor. Everybody say, I've been crowned with glory and honor. What did God say? He said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over 
crowned with glory, honor, and honor. In other words, God specifically blessed us. Oh, it's going to make the devil mad, isn't it? Listen, the more happier, more excited about God you get, you know the enemy's going to try to shut that off. So when it shows up and somebody says something rude to you, just, just laugh. Hey, I was expecting that. Thank you very much. You'll freak him out. Yeah, don't take the package. You know, people are going to hand you insults. They're going to say that you're going to interpret things and all that kind of stuff. Where are your eyes? Back on Jesus, folks. Don on people. All right, moving around right along here. <laughs> You have been made to have dominion over the works of your hands, and you have put all things under his feet. So that's Psalms 8. So God has, say, God has special plans for me. I need to get with them to find out what they are. Amen. So I'm going to stop right here before we go on, and I'm going to explain a lot of stuff, but I'm going to say, we're all believing, now listen to me, because I know you are too, for revival. How many are believing for revival? Amen. And we want it to sweep the land, don't we? In fact, if you listen to my intro, that's what we talked about. But first, revival must be in your heart. And so, revival will be in your heart when you stop thinking about how bad you're off. There's a couple of books that were written, I wish they weren't called Why Does Revival Terry? And the focus is in the book of all the nasty things we do and allow. No wonder God's not having revival. No, here's the problem. The problem is most people are focused on what they are, have wrong with them, but they're not going in and taking it to Jesus. But they're, they're going in and pray a little, some kind of little fast prayer and they won't give it to Jesus, won't let Jesus help, handle it. So they get up out of prayer and they carry all that crap around. Hello? We'll never amount to anything that way. You see, revival is not being stopped because of we're sinners. No. And here's another fallacy. God's not up there saying, you guys aren't ready, so I'm not sending revival. I got to talk to you about this. He's waiting for us to get with him so he can revive our heart so we can get with other people who have their hearts revived. And so one, two, three, four, start gathering. All of a sudden, the power of God starts sweeping people in. That's not going to happen if it's not happening in your life, in your home. And you can say, well, I don't think it really is happening like I want it to happen like that. There you go. You're on the right track. Now, do you want it to happen that way? Pay attention to my sermon today. All right. Not because I, I know anything great is what God gives me to share with me. Okay. So we find out what is man, spirit, soul, and body. Made a little lower than the angels, and yet we were crowned with great glory and honor. Two, we were created in the likeness of God, lesser than the creature like an angel, but yet given much more honor. To which of the angels has he said at any time, this is Hebrews, today sit down at my right hand. And yet the Bible says if you be in Christ, so we are seated with Christ at God's right hand. Woohoo! Hallelujah. I get all excited about it. It's okay to say woohoo. I watched a guy the other day. And he said woohoo and it was all right. Okay, so let's go on. <laughs> Third thing I want to bring to you is God gave us dominion. Now imagine this. How many are good imaginations? Okay, imagine that you've got your police outfit on. Okay, his name is Jesus. The next time the devil starts coming to you and starts harassing you, he's trying to get you out of the, your, your, your fellowship with God back into your thinking. So he comes to you and he troubles you in thought. So we move out of our confidence in God and get back to reason. Why is this happening to me? Here's what happens. So if the enemy comes to you, the enemy comes to you and threatens you, here's what you should do. How many know have Jesus in your heart? 
Can imagine it. Well, how many's ever met a detective or maybe an undercover? You know, I have some friends that are undercover NSA and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, and they'll come up like if they're going to bust somebody and you don't know they're a cop and all of a sudden they'll pull out their badge, you're under arrest, kind of boom, boom, boom. Well, it's quite the same way with you and I. The enemy comes to you, he knows you. But then all of a sudden you open up and pull out the badge. I belong to God. It is finished. Leave me alone. Immediately the devil will back off. But we don't do that. We begin to reason. What is going on? All that kind of... Satan's a master of keeping us in our head. Lean not to our own understanding. He wants to move us from here to the head. Okay, so let's look at these body parts. Let's find out how they operate, how the scripture works. You ready? I am. I got so excited this morning. I'm, I'm wiping tears. I'm weeping before God. I'm going, God, God, help me remember that. Making notes on my notes, you know, and everything like that. All right, so mankind was the under ruler in the earth under God. Didn't God give us that authority? And we know that Satan took it from Adam and Eve, didn't he? Even in, in the temptations of Jesus, one, one temptation, all these kingdoms I will give to you if you bow down and worship me, because they were turned over to me from someone else, Adam. Okay, so you got that. All right, understand each of the three parts, how they function, what they are. Did you know every function, your spirit, your soul, and your body, they have voices? Each one has a voice, and if you don't recognize it, you'll think it's all you. <laughs> all right, let's move right on. Okay, here we go. All right, understanding the parts. Okay, all right, so we know it sanctifies spirit, soul, and body. Number one, we are a spirit. So if we left our body, folks, you're a spirit. If you somehow, and God forbid, I'm only using this as an illustration, leaped out of your body and stood and faced you, it would look identical just like you because it's you. How you know about the shape of your spirit is this. It pushes right up on the inside of your body. So if it le could leap out of your spirit, out of your body, it would face you. It would look just like you without any pock marks, wrinkles, or anything else. That's your spirit. It's you. It has shape. People will recognize you. Can you say amen? It's not some floating baduba somewhere. <laughs> it looks just like you. Amen. And when your spirit leaves your body, you're dead. It goes one or two places. And of course, we're saved. So it's going to go up. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. All right. So your spirit is that. Now, I'm not done. Let's get into this. Okay. Now, our spirit has a voice. And the voice of your human spirit, whether you're saved or unsaved, is your conscience. How many has ever heard your conscience? Now, when you weren't saved, your conscience isn't necessarily correct. Because it's running off of a, whatever it learned. But when you get saved, God comes to live in your spirit. You see, Jesus comes, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit comes to live in your spirit. So now your spirit doesn't just look like you. If it leaped out of you with God in it, it would shine, it would blind you. Because God has now lit your spirit and almighty God himself is resident in your human spirit. You're a new creation. God's not over here in your spirit and your spirit's over here. No, like coffee. I don't know, I like my coffee with a little cream and sugar. Okay, and I got, when you pour the coffee, it's just black. But you put a little cream in there, put a little sugar, and then what do you do? You stir it all up so it becomes one substance. God came into your heart, into your spirit, and he stirred you up, and you became a new godly creature. That's why Satan doesn't want you to live from here. He wants you to live from here. Because the moment, even if you're a child and you stumble a lot and you live from your spirit, he can't touch you. 
You're like fire to him. So every man is tempted when he draws you out of that realm and into your own thing. Oh, you poor thing. Nobody said hi, church. <laughs> and then you slip out of the spirit into the flesh. And the enemy says, oh, let's tempt him a little bit more. And then sends a brother or sister next to you and says, yeah, I understand they did that to me too. <laughs> Misery likes company. Are you with me? So your spirit is an amazing thing. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. We have to see ourselves the way God recreated us. That means he lit our spirit and we went back up as light. Hello. Now you'll understand the scripture says, no man has lighted a candle and put it under a bushel. But instead, you take the candle and you put it on a candle stand and you light the entire house. What is he talking about? God lit your spirit. Hi, candles. He lit your light bulb in there. Don't cover it up with your flesh. That's what he says. You don't cover it with a bushel or hide it under a bed. Don't be ashamed of what you have in your heart because it will raise the dead. It will. You. <laughs> God raised me from the dead. Hello. He raised you from the dead too. <laughs> when you said, Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me. And God says, right on. Let's go. Let's show the devil he is a fool. God is waiting for you to believe him. I remember Smith Wigglesworth. Anybody heard that name, Smith Wigglesworth? Read his books. I mean, just a fifth grade education. He knew hardly anything socially. But man, was he a man of God. It's either believe God or not. Everybody should be that way, but we should not be antagonistic with the gospel. Do you know what it means? You better cry or fry, sister. Shake or bake. <laughs> Read the book or cook. <laughs> I got a bunch of them. Hey, is this seat saved? Are you? <laughs> Listen, folks, it's, it's a wonderful gospel. Say, I am a, a child of God. My spirit is lit. I'm on fire. If my head don't talk me out of it. There you go. Isn't our God a consuming fire? Does he live in your spirit? Yes. So, doesn't fire need fuel? Doesn't fire need fuel? Yes. How many have a fireplace at your house? Maybe a, a pellet stove or a wood stove? Or No hands go up. Well, back in the olden days, <laughs> you had to keep the fuel going, right? Well, here's how it works. You got God. He's already fired up inside of you. But you got to shove the word. It's the fuel in, into you to get the fire hotter. And then, have you ever been out in the field where they're burning slag? You know, they put all it in the pile. They turn a couple of fans on it, light it on fire, and the fans keep blowing it, and it burns it all up, right? You know what the fan is in your life? That's your spiritual language. You want to get that fire hot? Try shinmony in my times, you know. Try bringing out your spiritual language or lots of praise. If you don't have your language, don't worry about it. And lots of praise until the fire gets hot. So, well, Pastor Kerry, what do you do in the morning when you meet with God? Well, I get him to shut my mind down. I get him to shut my flesh down. And then I get him to blow heat into my spirit and get the fire burning. Amen. You don't get your fire burning. That's the lie. Well, you got to get into the Word so you can get the fire going. Oh, you get into the Word so God can make the fire rise. Hello. God does the work. You just get yourself there. You know why church is so cool? Because church is set up just like sitting at the feet of Jesus. When you come to church, everything should be under the blood 
And you should be focusing, I'm going to sit under the word and at the feet of Jesus. Now, I know it's me. Forget about that part. It's the word. Can you say amen? Do you have ears to hear? Now, listen. So our spirit is our conscience. Can you say amen? amen? All right. Two, we have a soul. Let me tell you what it is. You might have to use shorthand on this. Your soul is your mind, your will. It's your appetites, or what I mean by that, the things that cause you to like the way you like or to drive the way you drive. I'm not talking about a car. Okay, so it, it's your mind, will, emotions, appetites, personality, intellect. Say, I got all that. If not, go back and listen to this. That's who your soul is. So here's how it happens. When you come down from God, your spirit and soul comes directly from God, and your husband and wife, mom and dad, have united, and we know that the embryo is in there. And soon as the child, as soon as there is a conception, God puts a soul and spirit in there. You! And it, that's, as it is written, he knew you before you were born. Because he put you into you. Hello. Now somebody says, well, if the enemy messed up the human race, why didn't God just stop everything and start again? Once God's got something in motion, it has to play all the way through. Never forget that principle. That's another sermon. Okay. How you leave a place is how you enter the next. Okay, so your soul is like a big blank sheet when you're born. And so you're born under mom and dad. And if you were, happen to be fortunate like I was, my mom and dad were pretty much together. They had problems, but some families, you know, moms and dads are not there. And we know all the tragedies and all that. But that's the way it was originally supposed to be. Your soul was supposed to be educated and programmed. Can you say amen? So... Say, I have, I have several programs several. in my soul that make me me. I can't be anyone else. It makes me a female or a male. Let me say it better. Either you're born a female, and it's in there for female, for you, and, or you're born a male. There isn't any switching. And here's what happens when a person thinks that they are a female when they're actually a male. That's a devil doing that. They're not born that way. God didn't make a mistake. That's a devil. And somehow in their childhood leaped in them as possessing their thoughts. And you know, if you go against what's already in your spirit, you'll become corrupted. And so in, in my heart, there are several things that God put when I was born. He put the ability to communicate in me. I didn't learn that. I always had a big mouth. <laughs> Hello, I have a gift to gab. I'm not putting myself down. There's certain things that you, maybe you have. Maybe a talent to learn, a talent to be creative. There's certain talents that are already in you. We talk about in the Bible, Jesus talked about as the talents that were given five to one, two to another, and one to another. Each one to trade their talents and use them for God. Can you say amen? amen. But then some talents you learn. You learn how to play something or you do how that kind. But Initially, in your soul, there are certain things that you have no one else has that makes you unique and your personality you. How many know that when Jesus stood Adam up, he breathed the breath of life in him and he became a living what? Soul. Personality. So look at, your pers look at the person next to you and say, what a personality. <laughs> How many know you could have a sour one or a good one, couldn't you? All right, so you know what your spirit is now. What's the voice of your spirit? Your conscience. What's the voice of your soul? No, reasonings. Reasonings and arguments. Reasonings and arguments. Reasonings and arguments. Right? 
So how many know when somebody tells you a story, if you've never heard that story before, immediately you go to reasoning, seeing if that's true or not. See, it's okay, it's your soul. But how many know we can, our reasoning can be deceived if we don't have it under God? Absolutely. There's, why do we have all, so many strange people out there? Somebody's telling them something and it isn't God. And thirdly is your body. Everyone say, my bod. Amen. All right, your body is your earth suit. It'd be a terrible thing. And I, I've experienced, well, how many's ever had your arm go to sleep when you're asleep? And you wake up and you went to scratch your head or something, some knob hits you in the head. You know, <laughs> you know the feeling, right? All right? So your body needs to be subjection to your spirit. So your spirit, without God, your spirit's king, your soul is your servant, and your body is your slave. That's the way it's supposed to function. So when you say, take, grab that cup of water, your hand doesn't look at you and go, you grab it yourself. <laughs> no, it follows you. You say, why are you explaining these things to me? Because if you don't know that your body isn't following what your spirit is saying, you need to stop, get it under, so God can begin to use you. All right, say, I got it. So what would be the voice of your body? Feelings, nothing more. Remember that song? Feelings, trying to forget the feelings of love. Why? Because they left you? <laughs> Hello? So the voice of your conscience, your spirit, voice of your soul, your reasonings, and the voice of your body, feelings. Amen? Now, how many ever had your feelings tell you don't do something that your heart says go? Now you're understanding why it's so important to get with God first thing so he can straighten all of that in order. Can you say amen? amen? All right. So understanding what each part does, can, is that a pretty enough good understanding? So what got born again? Which part of you got born again? Your spirit. Who lives in there? God. What part is being renewed and changed? Your soul. That's why you got to get your mind in the word so that you can be reprogrammed for success. Hello? You don't keep on doing the same dumb things over and over, waiting for something to change. Moving right along. All right. Here's some things to consider on your mind. How many ever have your mind give you a little, a little problem sometimes? It runs off with you. Folks, don't let your mind run away. Control your thinking. If your mind's out here somewhere thinking goofy things and stuff that you don't know if it's real or not, say no. You talk to your mind. It's supposed to serve your spirit. It's a computer. Does your computer get off its desk and run through your living room? Go, na, 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 na. Huh? Well, no, it's made to serve you, so your mind is not supposed to do that either. So... Did you know the mind is a unique thing? I'm going I'm to stay here for just a minute. The mind's unique because it's a coupler. How many know that your elbow, this elbow, couples the lower arm to the upper arm, right? Now, if I came along and popped your elbow out of there, how useful would your arm be? It wouldn't. Lower or the upper. That's why the greatest place Satan attacks is your mind. Because it's the coupler between your spirit and your body. And if the enemy can get you out of whack in your thinking, he's got you. You're going to bumble and stumble through the day. So the battle of the mind is the biggest way in which the enemy attacks. But you know he's a liar. So if you pray and you ask God to answer the prayer and, and suddenly you hear this voice saying, you're not going to get it, you're not worthy enough, what should you do? Get up and do a happy dance because the devil just told you it's coming. Whenever the devil says you're not going to get something, you know you're getting it. He must believe you're getting it or he wouldn't try to lie to you. Jeez. 
We've been creatures hanging out in the swamp too long. Speak for yourself, Pastor Curry. <laughs> Amen. All right, so let's go on. All right, so the place and voice of these three parts. Romans 12, please look at verses 1 through 2. 1 and 2. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I'm going to show you the different pieces of our person. Remember, we're a three-part being. Here Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. How many here are glad God's merciful? Amen. That you, say the word you. you. The you there is not talking about your body. It's not talking about your mind. You, you as a spiritual Christian, take your bod first thing in the morning and plop it down on the altar. Hello? I'm just being a little graphic here. Because if you don't take your body and bring it to God, it will take itself and it will go whatever it does, whatever it feels like. So let's look at what it says. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you, your spirit man, present your body a living sacrifice. Holy, set apart, acceptable to God. See, God cannot fellowship with you if you're in the flesh. He that is in the flesh cannot please God, Romans 8. So when we approach God in our flesh, which we do, and we haven't put it on the altar, take a little minute and say, Lord, I lay my flesh down because I want to talk with you in spiritual realm. You see what I'm saying? All right. And if not, ask me some questions later. And he says that you, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Everybody say reasonable. God asked me to do a reasonable thing. What's that, Pastor Kerry? Lay your bod on the altar first thing in the morning. It's reasonable for you to do that. It will be very unreasonable if you don't. Because it'll get out of line somewhere. Not, I'll ask your wife. <laughs> Move her right along. I'm just choking with that. So catch this, all right? And then it says, lay it on the altar and be not conformed to this world. What is the world trying to do? It's trying to put us all in its mold. I'm not going to be a, a socialist or a communist. I'm sorry. It doesn't work for me to take my riches and give it to the poor because the poor people will stay poor and they'll keep wanting my riches. And I don't have any. <laughs> Hello. Olive, did you know you're all rich? You go to the poorest family in Haiti or in Africa, you're all rich. If you have one TV, you're rich. If you have one car, you're really rich. God forbid if you have a TV in your bedroom, you're filthy rich. But we don't look at it that way. Here's the thing. How hard is it for a rich person to get into the kingdom of heaven? Well, it's almost impossible because they trust in riches and not in God. Moving right along. Now listen to this. And that be not conformed to this world, be it transformed by the what? So here we have all three. You present your body and get your mind in the word. You present your body and get your mind in the word. Why? So you be able to walk out in your life the good the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. That's all God requires us to do. Lay the bod down. What'd you do this morning? I laid myself out. Didn't fall on the floor. I sat down in a chair, drank my coffee, and I asked God to crucify me. What do you mean? How do you do it? So I'm going to do in a sermon, I'm going to bring up a high table here and my chair, and I'm going to actually go through Psalms 5 with you. And we're going to show you what you should be doing in the morning, some basic things that you should be covering. It isn't anything different. I'm not anything special. But Jesus did that when he gave the Lord's Prayer, didn't he? This is the way you should cover when you do pray. Make sure you hallow God. Make sure you know he's Mr. Cool. And second of all, that the kingdom come, the will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's no sick. There's no frustrations in heaven. So God wants you to move on his behalf in the earth. Lead us not into temptation. Let us forgive those who trespass against us. For in thine is the kingdom and the glory for I know I left the scripture out of there. But so there was a model prayer. I want to model that because a lot of Christians don't know how to start their day off. 
They'll say, hi, God, and everything. It's, it's absolutely okay. But spending the time in the morning that you need is like God tuning up a fine violin or guitar, a 12-string guitar, so that when you strum, it almost plays itself. When God gets you in tune and just breathes your way, you will follow God and you will become a symphony of blessings in the earth. Amen. Amen. It only takes a spark to get a fire going. And soon all those around will warm up in its glowing. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you love that life. You love his love. You love to pass it on. And that's it. It's infectious. So if you're on fire, we can teach you how to get on fire while meeting with God. And that fire keeps burning through you. And then when we get together, we got fire, 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 fire. All you guys are on fire. Then revival happens, you see. But then there are those people, uh, excuse me for my reality to you, that will sit in a congregation as a mugwomp and they won't move for anything. God will remove them. And put somebody there that will get with it. Remember, it's God's church and he puts the people there. As it pleases him. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. <laughs> All right, let's go on. All right, so Romans 12 says, we, the spirit person, present our body. You see all three? And then get our mind in the word. Why? Because there's bad programming in here. Bad programming. My next point, the order of function. Your spirit, soul, and body has an order of function. If anything gets out of that order, you're immediately going to fail. So stop, get everything back in that order. Spirit is king. Soul is servant. Body is slave. Don't let the slave tell your, your mind what to do. And don't let your mind order your spirit around. You go to God from what I told you and help him arrange it. You'll find your Christianity will take on a much better residence and resounding testimony to God. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Colossians, listen to this. Here's Colossians 3. Wonderful scripture, but you can see all three parts in it. Let's look at this. Colossians 3, 1 through 3. It says, if then you were risen with Christ. Are we risen with Christ? Let me ask you, all right. So if you're risen with Christ, which part of you is risen? Your spirit. Woo Your spirit doesn't have a limitation unless you put it under the bondage of your thinking. Because the Bible says you are alive spiritually and you're sitting here right here in Christ-centered ministry, but you're also seated with Christ in heavenly places. Your spirit... It's unusual. <coughs> Another thing is Satan can't touch your spirit. He can't go in and go, got your spirit. I guess it's spirit. He can't get in there. Who's in your spirit now? See, the idea is to get your mind to get with it. To think about who you are now, not what you were years ago. Stop reflecting back. Okay? You don't drive your life through the rear view mirror. I've been in a lot of revivals. I've been in a lot of meetings. We've had people leap. I've had arms and legs grow. I had nothing to do with it. God had everything to do with it. All he needed me to do is get out of the way and let my spirit soar. Yes. Can you say amen? amen? You too. You are that person. And who's been conning you, telling you you're never going to be anything? Who's been trying to put you in a box? Who's been trying to pull you around? Don't you let him do that. He's a defeated fool. God's already judged him. He already is sentenced to hell. And right now, he's not there but he says, I'm going to get as many people to go with me as I can. 
Any volunteers? I got a play I'm going to do here shortly. God gave it to me. It's called This Is Your Life. So we'll go through it and we'll have a great time. We're going to do about a 10 minute skit. And I'm going to put all kinds of stuff on. We're going to show you some things. But anyway, that's another story too. All right, so Colossians, listen. If you then were risen with Christ, seek. The word seek means to desire after. How many here remember that man or that woman that just seemed to be the one? What did you do? You're on the phone forever. You were driving past their house. You were doing this and you were doing that. When the Bible says, seek ye first, now you understand. Everything goes aside and you go after it. Listen to what it says. If you be then risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind, put your mindset on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died. Don't dig yourself up. I'm going to be funny here. Don't dig yourself up. People bringing up their, their past and the things they're doing all the time instead of preaching the word. You're digging yourself up. Now, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I did this. We used to have this wonderful little cat and it died. 17 Fluffy. I tell this story a lot. If I'm going to tell the story, it's going to relate. And I buried him, her out there in the back. And it was great. And we had a little funeral, I had a little funeral thing and just doing the cat thing. And about four or five years later, my wife says, I'd like to have some place, you know, flowers and everything. And guess who I dug up? And, you know, Fluffy didn't smell very good. Remember, if I can use that, when you talk about yourself too much, Fluffy's going to start stinking. Hello. You guys are wonderful, but I want to hear what God's doing in your heart. What's he telling you? How he's showing you? You see, I'm a pastor. Naturally, I want to know those things. That's not to stop you about talking about your job or your things. You know, you can do all that. But what happens is Satan tries to get us to dig up Fluffy. And so you'll listen to conversations. I'm a real conversational listener. I listen intently. God taught me a long time ago to listen. Listen, listen. I watch people and I listen. And because you can just literally, if you could follow somebody around like a reporter and not say anything and just record that person and then play it back for them if they had the time to listen to it, they'd understand exactly what's going on with their life and be able to make the adjustments. But because we can't do that, we can ask the Holy Spirit to give us a feedback. Hello? If you dare. I ask the Lord at the end of the day, how did I do? And sometimes there's a real space. He's never going to tell you nor condemn you, but then he's going to wait till you get ready to hear. And he says, yep, yeah, you were a little impatient with a few people today. And then the tears will come. <laughs> the way God does it, he just massages your heart. You see, he wants us all revived. He wants us restored to back way we were in Adam, before Adam. Hello? That's the goal. Are you there yet? If you're not, let's all go. This is the great adventure. Now, let's, let's look at this. In, in 1 Peter chapter 2, it says this. We found out we present our body, get our mind in the word. And in 1 Peter chapter, uh, excuse me, 3 verse 4. Okay, it says, rather let it be the hidden person of the heart. Everyone say heart. heart. I want to know what the heart is. What's the heart of a tree? It's the core, isn't it? When you cut a tree down, there's a little core in the center. That's the heart of the tree. What's the heart of your life? It's not your thumper. It's the core of your being. It's both your spirit and soul. Everyone say spirit. And soul make the heart. 
So when you read in the Old Testament, remember Jesus didn't die, didn't rise again. It says that the heart is what? Deceitful and desperately wicked. How can you know it? That's before you get born again. The heart's corrupted. Then we receive Jesus, comes into our spirit and influences our soul. So when it says the hidden man of the heart, what's the hidden man of the heart? The spirit. And what's the outer man of the heart? The soul. Hello? So Satan can't get into your inner spirit. So he challenges your soul. And he says, ah, you're just ugly and you're never going to do anything right. And you, we, we get to think that and think we're saying it. Because it comes in our voice. You can hear your voice calling you some kind of turkey. Now, is that really you? Who is that? Yes, remember the time when they were in the garden and it says that they ate of that tree and their eyes were open? If you read that in the Hebrew, it says their brain became open and Satan could plant thoughts in their head. <laughs> and what he does, he uses your voice rolling through there. Or your mom's. Or something else. Come on, smile at me. Everybody learning anything. All right, so... If we don't go in and get tuned up in the morning, some of these things can get out of line. Can you say amen? We could get to be believing something really crazy. One minute we'll be preaching a mighty sermon and the devil will lay some kind of dump bomb in our brain. And next week we'll completely reverse the sermon because we listen to the negatives in our head. Listen, if it doesn't line up with scripture, don't entertain the thought. If you hear a thought saying, you're a real turkey, you'll never do anything right. That doesn't line up with the word, does it? So what do you do with that? You put it in the trash. Don't dwell on it all days. Let's go on past this. Now, rather let it be the hidden person of the heart, which is in the sight of God, a beautiful, gentle spirit. And which is very precious in God's eyes. Now, how many here remember the days when the church was so on fire, everybody was rebuking the devil and taking authority over it? How many remember those days? I rebuked the devil so many times, I lost my voice. I'm going to tell you, when you're fighting the devil, you'll love this. You don't fight. You don't have to scream. You don't have to threaten. You just say, Father, in Jesus' name, and he's already bound. I've cast out, and, and forgive me about the word I, but I've been involved in a lot of people who've gotten themselves in, Christian, some of them, got themselves so messed up with the enemy that the devil actually talked through them. We call it demonized. There's no such thing as demon-possessed. It's just demonized. Possessed. No one gets possessed. Okay? They can get controlled. So it's just not a real word in there. So it's harassed is the word demon-harassed. Well, if you think you're guilty and you think you're never going to amount to anything, you're going to get harassed. You've got a big sign saying, come and get me. Everybody hold up your sign. Say, I belong to Jesus. Yes. I'm trying to tell you about yourself, okay? You get up in the morning, let God put a spark, a skip, shut your brain down, shut your flesh down, and fill you with the Spirit. The Bible says, be not drunk with wine, we're in excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms, spiritual hymns, singing and making melody unto the Lord. That's what we need to be. This is the will of God, he said. This is what we need to be doing. Well, what about the devil? Let him wear himself out. Martin Luther, true story. He was coming down. Remember, he was a starter of a reformation from the Catholic Church, which, by the way, made a compromise with the devil back in the third century. Okay, we'll talk about that in another sermon. I'm not against the Catholic Church, No. But they built right over one of the Nephilim fallen angel strongholds in Rome. 
but we won't go there, okay? And underneath in their basement is all the stuff they don't want us to see. I have all kinds of information, but I want to give it to you in time, okay? Um, this is great. All right, so let's look at ourselves. We have a spirit, soul, and body. They all have to fall in harmony. Can you say amen? And the only one that can do that for us is Jesus. You can't do it for yourself. If you made a mistake, you can't make up for it. You go to God and have him make up for it. I love uh, works. Remember the works. Don't work to get somewhere. Work if you're going to work to get with God. Then he'll take you places. If you think about it, all the be benefits of your vacations and your, the blessings and the finances and the good things in your life, God gave you, you did not earn. Why? Because God doesn't want to share the work problem with you. He doesn't want to hear, I did this. I made this. No, he wants to hear, God helped me to make this. God helped me to do this. All right, move right on. Wineskins and garments, filling and cloaking. And then I'm going to finish with this, okay? Uh, I have a, one more scripture after that. But how many's ever heard, put on a garment of praise? Okay? How many's ever said, go to Jerusalem? This is in Luke, okay? 24, it says, go to Jerusalem and wait. Till you be endued with power from on high. Okay? So he said, to me, so you need to be clothed with something. Go to Jerusalem and be clothed with something. Everyone say, filled and clothed. Everyone say, wine skin and clothed. Okay. Here's how many read. He says, no one takes a new piece of cloth and sews it on an old garment. Remember the scripture? This is in Luke 5, if you want to read it up later, okay? Yet, the new piece of cloth won't match the old cloth. I used to be a hippie, so we used to do patches all the time, you know? And, uh, and the more patches than put in the bell bottoms and do all that kind of stuff, you know? But if you put a new piece of clothing on an old garment, it's going to pull. As it gets wet and everything, it's going to pull away from the old garment. Can you say amen? And you say, well, why is that in there? Very simple. In the Old Testament, we have a garment called our flesh. In the Old Testament, nobody was born again. Nobody, because Jesus hadn't died and rose again, nobody could have God dwelling in their spirit. Say amen. So the Holy Spirit would come on them like a new piece of clothing. And it would lead them one way where their old piece of clothing wanted to go the other. And they would tear at each other. Sounds familiar. That the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit gets. That's Old Testament anointing. So you get somebody like Samson. Anointing comes down on him. He kills all those people. And next thing you know, he's being petted by Delilah and getting his hair cut. The, the anointing pulled away from the flesh, from the old garments. Nobody puts a new piece of God. So God had to come up with the wine skin. Everyone say wine skin. Now, how many of you ever remember the Boda bags? You know, you put the, you put the juice and stuff in the old wine skin bag. You know, and you carry it around. You remember, that's what they drank from back in those days. Okay? We're not talking about booze here, all right? <laughs> but if you know anything about fermentation, if you find an old piece of wine skin... And you put brand new wine in it, it ferments. It expands. It will break it and it bursts it all and you lose everything. So no one takes a new wine and puts it in an old wine skin. He takes new wine and puts it in a renewed wine skin. In other words, you got to get born again so God will rub down your spirit so your spirit will expand and contract as God moves you. And so that expanding and contraction won't happen if you're not born again. So when you get born again, you get God on the inside and he rubs down your spirit so like a wine bag, it can expand with God's expressions and growth in your heart. Say amen. 
Well, I tell you what, you want to know all these parables, they're, they're good. I just don't have time to cover them all. So, in the Old Testament, they had a problem because the new anointing would pull away from the old people. So God, in the New Testament, what did he do? He conditioned the wineskin. We said, Jesus, come into our heart, forgive us of our sin. He came in, and he poured in oil and wine. Amen? And then when we follow God, it expands and the anointing works. Amen? Expands and the anointing works. All right, everyone say cloak and filling. Doesn't the Bible say be filled with the Spirit? Right? Okay, so imagine yourself as a vessel or a glass. What are you filled with? Yourself? Problems of the world? Or you tanked up this morning and got filled with God? How many know you can get so filled with God, Satan can't drop any dew drops in your glass? Can you say amen? If you went and poured under a pot, try this sometime. Get a little pure glass of water and put a little bit of coffee in it where it turns brown. Then put it under the faucet and let the faucet just run in there. Bit by bit, it'll push all of that stuff out and it'll become clear water again. That's what's going on with you. More exposure to God, the more he washes out the garbage. Can you say amen? Don't, no visiting with God, no being with God. You're just being religious. You're going to have garbage all your life. Only God can remove it. Say amen. So what does he do? So God wants us filled. So the infilling is for our daily life. Be filled with the spirit, right? But this is the one people don't realize. How many know what we just don't stay filled with the spirit? Periodically, we come into situations where we have to minister to somebody. Amen? So what's the cloaking for? For ministry. God fills you for life, for your life every day. You have to get refilled. And he cloaks you for ministry. Hello. And go to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit to what? Come upon you. And Paul prayed and the Holy Spirit came upon them. So filling, coming upon. Filling, coming upon. Filling, coming upon. Guaranteed, if you get filled in the morning and you're walking through your day, if the enemy or anything begins to come against you, there'll be a cloak that comes down you. And that's a cloak of righteousness. It's a cloak of light. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the cloaking that comes on you. And it's for ministry. So say, I'm a spirit. I have a soul. And I live in a body. In that order. I fill my spirit with God. I adjust my soul with the word. And God cloaks my flesh with himself. If you got something out of it this morning, would you give the Lord a praise?